Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here with you. It's been an absolute fantastic week for me to spend uh, with the community here at Papstus, sharing at uh, Sani every day, at least for a few days, and uh, hanging out with the youth. It's just been an absolute pleasure, a blessing to uh, just come and be with a community that's not only proclaiming, but trying to be knitted together and live out gospel, right? Gospel is the good news of, of our Father through Jesus Christ that says this one thing and this one thing as principle, for God so loved the world, right? This is, this is gospel, the Father's love for the world, and that that good news will liberate, it will free, it will do all manner of work in our lives that nothing else can do because the Father looks at us and says, I will give my life for you, my brother. The Father looks at you and says, your life is worth mine. And that thing changes. So last night, uh, can I get the, the stand, please? So last night, I, I shared something that is foundational and something that may have troubled folks, right? And today I want to expand on it. And it's this one, if you weren't here last night, well, thank you very much. If you weren't here last night, uh, let, let me trouble you like I troubled those last night, and then we're going to build off this thing, all right? I'm, I'm trying to be conscious of your time and that folks want to eat, right? But I'm also conscious that I came all the way from Hawaii. I'm going to preach. <laughs> Mess around, give me 20 minutes. Eh, it ain't happening. It ain't happening. <laughs> Brother going to come up here and work up a sweat. So I want to say this to you. Gospel foundation, rule, not rule number one, but something you need to know. God does not forgive sin. Hallelujah. <laughs> what? Ronnie, right? Ronnie wasn't listening last night, but now he's seated right there. God does not forgive sin. Somebody need to say hallelujah. You know why? God consumes sin in his body and condemns it in the death of Jesus Christ so that you and I might live in righteousness and liberty being dead to sin because it's done away with. God does not forgive sin. He forgives sinners. Get that gospel truth in you. You have been forgiven. You have been released from sin, from its dominion, from its power, from its passion, from its identity, from its stain, from all that is sin, you have been liberated because Jesus Christ in his body took on sin and consumed it, died for it, and rose victorious so that you might be his righteousness. Good gospel, right? So that then I could say wholeheartedly, God doesn't forgive sin, hallelujah. He forgives sinners. Right? He releases us from the liability of the offense of sin. Because he didn't just wash over the offense of sin. He consumed the offense of sin, condemned it. Resurrection, vindication. Right? That's, that's just a quick summary of what we talked about last night. I want to trouble you. Because then the question that comes after that is, okay, Jonathan, God doesn't forgive sin. He consumes it. And if anybody has a question biblically, just read Romans 8. All right? If you say to me, oh, I'm not sure about this God consuming sin, read Romans 8. Right? For now there is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, for the Spirit of God has done what the flesh could not do, which is what? Condemned sin in the body. So Romans 8 says, right? But here's what happens. Once we have this foundational piece that sin is consumed, it's condemned, the next question is, Jonathan, how do I stand in the confidence and the victory of that truth? How do I remain in the confidence knowing that sin is condemned? Because here's the truth, y'all. I can say sin is condemned, but let's be honest. At some point this week, we gonna mess it up. And we gonna feel like a what? Come on, you guys know the answer? You gonna feel like a sinner. You're going to feel like a sinner, and you're going to say, man, that God preached that, 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 that sin is condemned, but I feel like a sinner, right? And you're going to let that feeling and that circumstance of your life override the truth of what he says. And what I want to proclaim to you today and what we want to talk about is how, how 
We can let the truth of what he says be the thing that determines all of our reality so that the circumstances of this life, even when we return to the passions of our former ignorance and we think we're sinners, that does not overcome us. Let me say it again. What we want to talk about is how we can stand in the truth and the status of victory over this monster so that whenever the circumstances of life make us feel like we're less than, we put that truth on and we know that victory is ours so that we are never overcome by the deception, but we live by the truth. Amen? So that then we can say we live according to faith, not what we see or feel. Are you hearing me? All right, so that's what I want to break down today. And I got my trusty whiteboard here with me. This is kind of like, you know, uh, I spent the week with, um, with Pastor Norm and his family, lovely family. Him and his wife Liz have been so hospitable. You have a great, a, a great uh, servant in Norm, and you got to give thanks for that guy. Um, every morning he would make me toast and, and a little drink, and he knew what my order was as soon as I get up in the morning, make me my little toast with some butter and some jam, mm, New Zealand jam, the best, the better jam. <laughs> Ozzy's my, my, my good friend Cassie from Australia, New Zealand jam. All right, anyway. So, so Pastor Norm, uh, 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 a great servant, and, and what's, what's funny is that his little child, uh, uh, Noah, he has these two little blankies that have little dogs on them. They're his little doggies. Everybody knows Noah has seen them, his little doggies. Well, this is, this is the version of my doggy, my little blankie that I need when I'm on stage. All right, whenever I preach, I need a whiteboard so that I can deflect and, and, and demonstrate. So I came all the way from Hawaii, and I'm going to preach this thing. And I want to start with a story that we all know and that we all know very well. It's found in Luke 15. Luke 15, if you have a Bible, we're going to dive into this together. Luke 15 in the, uh, the uh, NLT, it's page 628. In the World Changers, it's 840. And you've heard this story before, and you're probably thinking to yourself, oh, man, I don't come to hear this guy. We came to church, this guy's going to preach, and he's going to preach on the passage that everybody preaches on all the time. There's nothing new about this, right? Because it's the story of the prodigal son. Like, oh, man, we, we've done the prodigal son a thousand times, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we just want to dive into the prodigal son because we've done it a thousand times. And honestly, it's a safe bet for me because it's such a good story and you know it so well. So when you're having dinner this afternoon and they ask, you know, what did the preacher preach about? You can say, oh, the prodigal son, right? So it's a win-win for everybody because we know the story so well, right? Right? So we want to dive into a story that we know so well because, hey, you know, get a little comfort, kind of like a blankie. We know a blankie so well it covers us. We feel good, right? So this is what we just want to cover this feel-good story. Or maybe there's something there that we could, might look at again. So Luke 15, since we know it so well, let's cover some of the territory that we already know so well. I'll I'll, I'll be drawing up here. Some of the territory that we know so well is that this is a story of a, you're in for a treat. If you've seen my artwork already, you're welcome. If you haven't, you're welcome, right? This is a story of a father. Uh Uh-huh, right? This is the story of a father and how many sons, y'all? Two, how many sons? Two, we got two sons, right? We got these two sons and these two sons have been hanging out with the father. Now this story is one that is actually trying to frame a reality that Jesus is speaking to. Because Jesus tells this story and he sets up this, uh, uh, this father and the son, we're just going to put uh, son one, we're going to put son number two, right? And uh, you see the text up there, and I probably won't read it because it's so long, but I'll just kind of roll right through it. Jesus sets up the story, and the reason Jesus sets up the story with a father and two sons is because he's speaking in a context where there's these groups of people, right? Jesus gathers together, he's about to tell this famous story that you and I know so well that it's a story about a father and two sons, and he's speaking to a particular crowd of people. If you were to go to Luke 15 and you go to chapter 1, I mean, verse 1, for instance, sorry I didn't give it to y'all, but if you were to go to verse 1, it says, tax collectors and other, and this version, I like this, it's all right, tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus preach. 
So Jesus is telling the story of a father with two sons to this group of people that are divided between tax collectors and notorious sinners. So you have son one and son two, tax collectors and notorious sinners. So that this is the framing of the story. However, there is another piece that maybe we don't know. We know that it's a story of son one, son two, tax collector sinners. Maybe we've covered that. But there's a piece that we may have overlooked. At least I overlooked it. I don't know if you have. That as Jesus is telling the story of the prodigals, of the, of the son one and son two, there is a background story that's working for the Pharisees and the notorious sinners. And that background story is found in Deuteronomy 21. Don't turn to it quite yet. But this background story in Deuteronomy 21 is how a father should re relate to a rebellious son. Are you with me? So Jesus steps down. He's about to tell this story. He's telling the story to a divided audience of sinners and Pharisees, all right? And you know that Pharisees were, how would you call them in New Zealand? You know, in, 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 the, in America, I think we would call Pharisees like, the stuck-ups, they're brown nosers, they're the well-to-dos that think they're better than everybody else, right? They're, they're these type of, you guys know this type of folk, right? You guys know this type of folk? Yeah, my sister's like this. She's the worst. <laughs> no, she's not at all, but I had to say that because sometimes she watches live. I want her to be shocked. She's like, no, I'm not. <laughs> You're not kidding. I love you. You're not like that at all. But these two groups of people, right, because I'm the better son, right? I'm not the judgy one. I'm the favorite. That's actually true. <laughs> so you have these two sons, you have son one, son two, you have a sinner, you have these sinners always behaving bad, they're the ones that are just always up to no good, and then you have the Pharisees that are stuck up, they, they, they got, they're, the, they're the preacher that has the top button buttoned, right? This is the Pharisee, right? This is the Pharisee, and Jesus knows he's talking to them too, but here's the background, here's the background, so good, Deuteronomy 21, Deuteronomy 21 is the background. You might be asking yourself, what's in Deuteronomy 21? Just wait for it, wait for it, wait for it. So let me tell you, let's tell this story. So Jesus tells the story that a man had two sons, and the younger son told his father, I want my share of the estate before you die. Right? This is all familiar to everybody? We've heard this much before? Now, again, since we've heard it, I want to ask several questions. Maybe I'll answer them myself. When the younger son comes and asks his father for the share of the estate, what is he basically telling his father? You've heard this before. You only get an inheritance after what happens to the parent. The parent dies. So the younger son is actually telling the older parent, the father, hey, I wish you were dead so I can get my money. Right? Right? And now what's fascinating is that um, the share of the estate, according to I'm gonna, Deuteronomy 21 and some other laws, that the father, if he was going to share his estate, he has to give two-thirds to the oldest son, and then the remaining third goes to the rest of the children, right? So if it was 10 children, uh, two-thirds, 66%, goes to the oldest son, and the remaining 33% goes to everybody else. Are you with me? So this is the law. So when the younger son comes up to his father and says, hey, man, wish you were dead. Give me my money. Right? Right? The father, unexplicably, because this is, this is what's so amazing about the story, the father, unexplicably, actually splits his money. The older one would get 66%, and then the younger one would get 33%. I know that doesn't add up to 100%, but it has to be 66.6666666, then it has to be 33.33333. And the reason I don't write it on the board is because one time I preached this, and I wrote 66.6%. You see how that plays out? And everybody's like, ooh, and take Christ. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're not in Revelation. We're in Luke. We're in Luke. And then I lost the plot, right? So that's why I do 66 and then 33, all right? But I know my math. I know it doesn't add up. Okay, got to carry the decimal. I get it. All right? So the younger son says, give me my money. And the father says, okay, what's fascinating First of all, is that the father would do this, that the father would freely give his money. Because what does the father have to do? He has to liquidate his estate. 
He has to somehow divide all the property in some sort of cash so that then he gives cash to the younger son. What does that mean? That might mean that the father who owns various estates has to sell off portions of his property in order to satisfy this bold and arrogant request of the younger son. Are you hearing me? So not only does he want his father dead, but now he also wants his father to liquidate his estate. And this is what's amazing. The father does. The father does. And you can imagine the Pharisees are listening to this, and they're like, man, this Jesus is reckless. Talking about a father who would liquidate his estate and then give a portion of his money to this arrogant, no good, notorious sinner. Right? The Pharisees are probably incensed. Like, I mean, that top collar is tight. The next just, yeah, like, this guy's crazy. And you know the notorious sinners, maybe you're sitting there like, wow, we would, wow, wow, who would have ever thought that? Wow. The father sold his, wow, okay, right? <laughs> Pharisees over here like, mm, 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 mm. The, 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 the notorious sinners, wow, 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 okay, all right. So everybody's interested to see what happens next. And of course, what happens next? We know the story. Younger son goes out and spends the 33% in wild and reckless living. Depending what your version of the Bible says, some of them are like licentious living. I like that word. Like living in licentiousness, right? And so, okay, one time I'm preaching this, one time I'm preaching this, and I go, licentious living. And somebody's like, what's licentious? <laughs> you didn't know what licentious was. This is good, good. Another, somebody else is like, what's licentious? And then you hear another echo that goes, it's the drugs, the drink, the women. <laughs> And I don't know why I made it sound like it was an islander. Sorry, D. Right? Like, but that's, that's, I'm from the islands, right? I'm Dominican, right? So I go, I'm, I'm Dominican, right? And that's, that, from where I'm from, Dominican Republic, that's what licentiousness is, right? The drugs, the drink, the lustfulness, we could say, right? And so the young son takes the property of the father, the property, the, the, the father being generous in liquidating his estate, and then furthermore, actually giving this money to the younger son, agreeing with the younger son that like, hey, yeah, it's better that I was dead and you had money. Think about this. This is what's going on. The younger son takes the money and goes out and lives this wild, reckless life just out there. I mean, he's, if it was in our day parlance, I mean, he's out there just like, turned down for what? I mean, he's out there, like the young kids say out here now, he's out there getting lit. Is is that how you young people say it, getting lit? Because I know I'm not cool anymore. I only look sort of trendy, but I'm old. You know how you know you're old? When you say something cool, and it is cool, and it's right, and the young people still laugh at you. You're done. You can't make it back from there. That happens to me all the time. I'm like, no, I'm hip. I'm trendy. They're like, "Mm, no. mm -mm." So the young man is out there, and he's living a licentious life. Wastes all his money. Check this out. Do you know that the word for property that the father gave the younger son in the Greek, I'm going to be that pastor, in the Greek is bios. Let that sit for a minute. The father gave his bios to his son. The father gave his life to this son, and the son does what with the life that he's given? Spends it recklessly. Now, I don't know if you're hearing this story and you're saying to yourself, oh, that sounds familiar. Because each and one of us, every one of us has been given a life. And maybe you're thinking to yourself, oh, yeah, I know that person who has taken life and lived recklessly. And if you're saying that to yourself right now, you're actually that person. Let me not dwell too much on that. So the young man out there, wild, reckless living, and we know the story. What happens in the story? That then he goes, finds himself without any money in feeding pigs, right? And Richard, 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 where is Richard? Richard, Karen's husband, Richard, pastor here, pointed something out to me that was very, very key. Is that this young man is sitting there, and does he eat the food of the pigs? Does he eat the food of the pigs, church? Richard pointed this out to me. It's right there in the text. No, he doesn't. He's about to eat the food of the pigs, and in that moment when he's about to eat, he's like wishing that he would eat, he comes to his senses. 
And he says to himself, man, how much food is there in my father's house? The servants have food. Maybe I can go back, be a servant, and get some food, right? And, and, and this is where we now say things like, oh, hallelujah, he repented, right? And we know the rest of the story, that he comes back, and who's there waiting for him? Father, open arms, right? And the father comes, and we also know, and I'm preaching stuff you guys already know, right? We also know that when the young man comes back from the pigs and his father is there, what should the father have done? The father should have killed him, right? We'll get to that in a minute. The father should have killed him. But what does the father do? The father, filled with compassion, runs to him, right? And, and, and the Bible tells us that he lifts up his thing, you know, like his, 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 his whatever it is, dress sort of thing, right? Rogue, rogue, that's the name, rogue, rogue. Lifts up, rogue, runs, right? And in that day, fathers of that esteem, really important men that have property, they don't run, right? Kids run. Women run. If they've seen their child, like they see, oh, my baby, oh, he's back home. In the Bible, I do, women run. Kids run. Fathers don't run. The father runs, loves up on them. We know this story, right? Right? Yes. And what do we get told? We get told, it's never too far. You can come home. Is that one that we get told? Have you heard that version? It's never too far. You can come home. Have you also heard the version that, hey, man, just repent. Just turn and come to your senses, just like he did when he was with the pigs and almost ate. He came to his senses. Have you heard that version? That if you repent, if you repent and you turn, who's going to be there for you? When you turn, who's there for you? Running to you. The Father, right? And we, this is good gospel because if I just, if, if I come to my senses, then. If I do this, then. Father's going to be there. He's running. I can come home. I've repented because I was a sinner and now I'm back in. I was a sinner, now I'm back in. You've heard this sermon, right? I'm not saying anything new, right? Amen, you've heard this sermon? Amen, amen, hallelujah. Let me ask you a question since, since we know this story so well. Can we go to Deuteronomy 21? If you have it there on Deuteronomy 21, this is the background of the story. This is what they would have known, the Pharisees and the notorious sinners, this story that we know so well. This is what they would have known. Suppose a man has a stubborn and rebellious son, son number two, who will not obey his father or mother. Did son number two obey? Did he obey? No. Even though they disciplined him. I'm sure they would have disciplined him. In such a case, the father and the mother must do what? They take the son of the elders as they hold court at the town gate. The parents must say to the elders, this son of ours is stubborn and rebellious and refuses to obey. He is a what? A glutton and a drunkard. Is that what the father did? Nah, uh, 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 uh. The father didn't do that. What did the father do? The father gave his life, his bios, his property, and sent the son on his way. The first thing that should have got their attention, and it did. Watch. Suppose, uh, keep, keep going, please. Then... This is what happens if the father had taken him to the gate. Look what should happen. Then all the men in his town must stone him to death. In this way, you will purge the evil from among you, and all Israel will hear about it and be afraid. So if you have a son like this who comes and says, give me the property, the requirement of the law is that this young man be taken to the gates be judged a glutton and a drunkard, and then be stoned so that this evil of disobedience might not take root in Israel. This is the background of Luke 15. Watch the next thing. If someone has committed a crime worthy of death, which is the crime of being a glutton and a drunkard, if a young man commits the crime of being a glutton and a drunkard, a crime worthy of death, and is executed, because this young man would have been executed, he would have been stoned, are you hearing me? What is then to happen? He is to be hung on a tree. 
The body must remain hanging from that tree overnight. You must bury the body that same day. For anyone who is hung is cursed in the sight of God. In this same way, you will prevent the defilement of the land of the Lord your God is given to you for a special possession. Watch how this works. Look, look at this. How is it that the very land that the father sold to get money to give to this young man, how is that very land supposed to be protected? That very land, according to the law, is supposed to be protected by actually killing this young man, hanging him on a tree as a deterrent to disobedience. You think the Pharisees knew this? Oh, they knew this. You think the notorious sinners knew this? Oh, they knew this. And what are they seeing? They're seeing a picture of a father they have never, ever seen before. A father who instead of accusing and condemning gives life. And he gives life in freedom and says, do whatever you will with this life. Now, even then, at this point, this is a version of the gospel we all know, that it says, man, yeah, God gives us life, and then we can freely do what we want with it. But if, if we take this life and we live out with the pigs, it's up to us to repent. We got to feel bad about what we've done so that then we can come home. You've heard that version before? That, hey, man, God is so good. God is so good that he takes life and gives it to you because this is what each and every single one of us has right now. We have life and God is so good that then we take that life and you can live it however you want. But if you live it recklessly, you got to repent. You got to feel bad about what you've done. Two questions and then we're going to wrap this thing up. One, when the sun, well, maybe three questions. I'm a, I'm a preacher. I always try to extend my time, right? Let me do this for you. Can we just go real quick through the characters in the story? We have the father, we have the two sons. Who else do we have in this story that you know of? We have the servants, right? And then I always love when people do, um, they always do like the pig, right? Somebody says, you know, the, the pig, and again, you're, you're welcome for my awesome drawing. Yeah, that's a pig. So we have, we have the servants, right? We got the pig, right? We got, these are the people in the story. Father, the son, the son goes out, gets with the pigs, he comes back, the servants. You know this, right? We're good. These are the people in the story, right? That's the one question. Okay, question number two. When son number two leaves, right? When he leaves, what? is his identity before the father? If you had to name it with one word, what is his identity before the father? A son. Are we agreed there? He's a rebellious prodigal son, but is he a son? Yes. As he lives, and he goes and lives in licentious living. Please go back to Luke 15. As he goes and lives in licentious living, and he lives recklessly with the drugs, the drink, and the lust, what is his identity? A what? A, a, a what? Yeah, I'm going to need y'all to help me out on this. I'm preaching now. This ain't about performance. We got to do this together. When he's out there living in lust and licentiousness and in the wickedness of sin, what is he? A son. Let that hit you for a second. When you're out there living in the midst of sin, when you're out there condemned by these ideas in your mind that says you're not good enough, when you're there in the midst of the pigs, and that behavior in your mind disqualifies you from a standing before your father, this story says that even in the midst of that, you're still a what? Uh-huh. When the young man comes to his senses, what is it that he says? He says what? How many what are in my father's house? Servants. And what does he plot in his mind? Does he plot to return to his father's house as a son or as a servant? Does he plot to return to his father's house as a son or as a servant? As a servant, right? But you just told me that even in living licentiously, his status would have still been what? A son. 
What is it that made this young man be amongst the pigs and all of a sudden fashion a story that paints himself as a sinner and as a servant? What is it? Guilt. My brother says guilt. I think to some degree maybe guilt. But I want to draw to your attention that you've missed somebody in this story. Look at verse 14. And about that time that his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land. And he persuaded a local fa farmer to hire him. I don't like this version. If you read the King James, well, I'm not King James. The text actually says that he sold himself to the citizen of another country. This is trying to make it like palatable for us. It's just not a farmer. It's he sold himself to a citizen of the other country. The Bible has an identity for the citizen of the other country. He's called the God of this world. He's called the prince of the power of the air. He's called the father of lies who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So that he stands in contrast to the heart of the father. See, the father gives life. See, the father is willing to take everything that he has and give it to a son, even if a son is rebellious. But the citizen of the other country sees somebody in need, and instead of letting the assistance, what he does is he categorizes them as a servant. It's the citizen of the other country who would take a son and make them a servant by enslaving them in his economy. Because when we walk away from the love of the Father, we never stop being sons until we believe the lie of the citizen of the other country that tells us we're less than what the Father says we are. So instead of standing in the truth of our status as sons, we conceive and convince ourselves that we're servants. And we say to ourselves, I am no longer worthy to be called a son. Maybe if I go back and I feel bad enough and I say, oh, I'm such a wretch, maybe my father will give me just a little bit so that I can have some food and survive. And so we live on this Christian cycle that says, oh, I feel condemned in my mind. I must be a terrible sinner. If I go back to God and I feel bad enough and I confess and I say, oh, yeah, I did that sin, all of a sudden maybe my father will give me the little bit of forgiveness I need so I can live for the next six days until I come back to church on the seventh day needing more of that forgiveness because I'm such a sinner. That's a lie from the pit of hell. That's not the father and the God we worship. That is not the father and the God we worship. The father and the God that we worship sees you and me amongst the pigs. And this is what this story is meant for them to understand that doesn't get told. He sees us amongst the pigs and he says, I will not abide that my son or my daughter remain under the captivity of a broken idea of who they are. I will not allow them to continue to live a life that sells themselves short, thinking that they're less than than the very creation of God. I will not allow them to stay in the muck and the dirt and have them be convinced that somehow they don't bear the image of God. That is a lie. For they do bear the image of God. It's just that that image is marred because they don't know the truth of who I am. And see, the father sees this. He sees the young man in the pigs. And you know what he does? He rises from his throne and he says, I'm going to get him. And in that moment, when he's about to go, the older brother puts his hands on the father's shoulder. And he says, Father, you sit down. I'll go and get my brothers and sisters. I'll go and redeem them. And so our older brother, the man Jesus Christ, he comes and finds us where we are. And he says, son and daughter of the living God, I know 
that you think right now you're a servant. I know right now you're feeling condemnation, shame, and guilt, and that somehow your father will not accept you. I know that you know that if you come back, you must be stoned and hung on a tree. Son of the living God, my brother, my sister, I offer you this. I will take the 66% that is mine. I will give it to you, and I will receive the stoning, and I will be hung on a tree so that your offense will not be counted against you, and this lie can be put on my body, and I will suffer death on your behalf so that you might have access to the home that has always been yours, that you might walk in the truth of the status that had always been yours, and that you might know that you are greatly loved. That is why your older brother is here. So the story is of a prodigal son. This passage is not about a servant. It's the citizen of the other country who would have us thinking that we're less than what the father says we are. And the father loves you so much that he has sent our older brother, Jesus Christ, to declare the truth of the value, the worth, and the identity that we have in him. And that is that we are the children of God, bearers of his image. If you ever hear a gospel that tells you you are somehow less than this truth, let that gospel be anathema. Let it be cut off. Because for God so loved you that he gave our older brother. If you hear a gospel that tells you that you're just sin waiting to happen and you need to watch out so you don't sin, let that gospel be cut off. Because the love of our father says he sent our older brother to consume sin so that we might be free from it. If there is a gospel that tells you that you need to be and strive after something that you're not, let that gospel be anathema because you are what he says you are. You are his son and his daughter today. And the call of God is for you to understand that truth and grow up in it. You might not be fully mature in the truth of your status as a son and a daughter, but that does not make you anything less than a son and a daughter. We are children of the living God. And our father has sent our older brother Jesus to declare this very truth. For cursed is anybody who hangs on that tree. And Jesus Christ became a curse for us so that you and I might shine as the righteousness of God. Are you hearing me? This is who you are today. This is who you are right now. Now you say to me, Jonathan, but I still feel like a sinner throughout the week. I still fall short. I know I fall short. And I say, absolutely. Absolutely you do. But here is the victory, and here is how you stand in the confidence. Don't you ever, ever, never, ever, never let feelings override the truth of what you are. Don't you ever let feelings override the truth of you are. Do you feel weak? Do you feel as though you can't measure up to the status that is out there? Hallelujah. Claim the truth of your status as a son and a daughter, even in spite of how you feel. Let me tell you something that maybe doesn't get preached enough about Luke 15. There is no repentance in Luke 15. There is no repentance in the story of the prodigal son. Do you know that? People want to talk about like, oh, he, he came to his sense and he repented. No, he didn't. He was hungry. He was hungry. He wasn't sad about the sin he had committed. He was hungry. He was living according to his senses. Do you know what the Bible calls that? The Bible calls that sensual living. Do you know what else the Bible calls sensual living? When you return to God because you're hungry? You know what else the Bible calls that? It calls it unbelief. Because you're relating to God for what you can get and not for who he is. The prodigal son never repented. What happened with the prodigal son? He was enveloped by grace. And being enveloped in grace, then he could live out the truth of who he was and receive the gift of repentance. Because repentance is a gift given to sons and daughters, not something that sinners conjure up. 
You receive the truth of his love, and in receiving the truth of his love, you turn away from the lie of the citizen of the other country. And when you turn, that's repentance. And as you see him for who he is, and you see the love of your older brother, you confess the same word he speaks about you, that you are who he says you are, and you're not the lie that the citizen of the other country is trying to tell you. So you leave in turn repentance, you confess the truth of who you are, confession, and then you walk in that status that's righteousness in a life of faith so we move from victory to victory to victory from grace upon grace upon grace the gospel is the message of your beloved status before the father now here's the thing we do not hold that status for ourselves we hold that status to give it away to others so that others might know they're not sin waiting to happen they're sons who might have gone prodigal. So I want to pray in this moment as I close. If there's anybody here that is in need of receiving, receiving your status. If you say, I didn't know. I didn't know. And you want to receive the status. Let me at least pray with you. Doesn't mean you have to come up, but you can. But if you're that person, say it in your heart. Raise a holy hand. Whatever it is that the Spirit is telling you to do, and let me pray for you. If there are those who have been walking a long life of repentance and the cycle of shame and want to live in confidence, I want to pray for you too. You can stand, you can come up, lift a holy hand. But I need each and every single one of you to know that the gospel is the love of a father to sons and daughters. The gospel is the love of a father to sons and daughters. Amen? Let me pray with you as we close. Father God, in this moment, according to the gospel of your son, Jesus Christ, that redeems us and restores us and that names us as the beloved of your heart, that you say that we have been loved with a great love that calls us children and that we can choose you because you first chose us. Lord, in those moments in this life, when we feel assailed by condemnation, shame, and guilt, might we rebuke that spirit by standing in the truth that says, I am a son, I am a daughter, and although I am prodigal, I know that the Father's heart is for me. Lord, might that truth forever be on our lips because you've convicted us in our hearts, that according to the testimony of the life of your son, Jesus Christ, and the vindication by the spirit, that we can stand in confidence that we are your sons and your daughters. There are people here right now, Lord, that are under the conviction of your Holy Spirit. There are people here right now, Lord, that are under the conviction of your Holy Spirit. I pray that your spirit might wrestle with them, that it might contend with a heart that doesn't know how to receive this truth, but that your spirit might come as a spirit of truth and that then it might abide as a spirit of comfort for there is comfort in the truth. I seal these people according to your gospel and according to your love, the community here in South Auckland, perhaps the SDA, that they might live a life from this confidence as sons and daughters and manifest your love. Thank you for this opportunity and thank you for everything that you are to us. I pray that we might be found faithful as we hold this truth in our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.